You're listening to CKNW's Chief Executives, live from SFU's Beatty School of Business, presented by Fortis BC, energy solutions for every customer. Well, thank you for taking time to do this. And, and take us back to the beginning. Tell us, tell us a little bit about your journey. Where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? Uh, I grew up in uh, a farming community in South Africa, uh, sort of in the foothills of the mountains. I actually I grew up in the mountains. Um, went to a boarding school because being in a fairly remote rural area, there weren't any schools around. Um, and from there, uh, I remember as a kid, having spent my life in the mountains and growing up, that surfers were the coolest people around, and surfers had all the girls. So I spent my whole high school career trying to get to the coast and become a surfer. Um, in South Africa in those days, you had to do military service. It was, it was mandatory, and I spent two years doing military service, um, a number of which were in active service at the time of the Angolan War. It just it was, uh, Timing is everything. And from there then uh, went to uh, went to the... I was in the army in Cape Town, so I moved from my home to Cape Town, which is a coastal city. It's a and city. Yes. And uh, then stayed in Cape Town and started surfing, where all the girls were. It was fantastic. Yeah. That worked out well for you? It worked out well for me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and did you think about what you wanted to do as a career, post-military, post-surfing? No, um, to be absolutely honest, uh, when I went to university in those days, my dad, who was never really that involved in what I was going to do or not, um, suddenly got interested in the fact that I wanted to be an architect. And in those days, architecture wasn't a real going concern. So he stepped in and said, you're not going to be an architect. That's, there's just no future being an architect. So to spite him, I chose the most esoteric degree I could, and that was theatre. <laughs> and uh, and I, I, I'm... He must have not, been thrilled. He was, well, he, he couldn't say anything because his hands were tied. He said anything but. So I didn't, I didn't do architecture. Still love it today. Um, but it, it, was, it was a really cool time to be at university because our class was half male, half female. I think it was one of two straight guys and all the women weren't experimentation in those days. So it was, it was a fun time. But <laughs> I, I'm kidding, sorry. The, uh, Remember your wife is here. Yeah, she, she, she knows all these stories um, and more which we won't talk about right now, but um, it was actually, it was, a dual, it was a joint degree diploma. And part of the diploma was uh, that you had to learn uh, stagecraft, uh, set design, sound design, lighting, uh, and costume design. And in my final year of university, um, right before the end, I had the opportunity to represent my country in sport. And once again, that young male thing kicked in, and I, I wanted to do this sport. I didn't want to be university anymore. So I left university before I graduated and went to try and be a professional sports person, which, which failed completely because I suddenly realized I'd never make any money doing that. So I had to go back and work. And my first job, I happened to fall into it because of costume design. And the fact that I'd done costume design at university um, allowed me to take on my first job as a jeans designer. So I started my career as a designer of denim. It was... Uh, well, it's a form of architecture. Yeah, they were men's jeans, unfortunately, so... <laughs> <laughs> and so where did you go from there? Um, I, the, the glamorous end of the business in those days was not so much the design, it was actually... Uh, I guess in those days, South Africa was the, the China of, the, of Europe in terms of garment manufacture. And the organization that I worked for um, was a quality producer of primarily menswear, but some women's wear as well, and a lot of tailored product for Germany, UK, Japan, and affluent markets. And the people that, that went um, and managed those accounts spent all this time traveling abroad. And it was, once again, it was this, this great romantic sort of notion of, I wanted to be that person. I want to travel abroad and go to all these, these cities. So I 
work my way from designer to product manager. And as product manager, then I got to be that person that traveled and dealt with the clients and learned the commercial aspect of um, business. Um, and then from the commercial aspect, having both the design and the commercial side of things, um, my career really started moving from there to different organizations. And um, interestingly, when uh, during the, the, the apartheid, so the, at the end of the apartheid years, when uh, North America and Scandinavia had placed boycotts on South, Af South Africa, a number of countries were coming into South Africa. And at that time, uh, Adidas believed that they could do more good by engaging in South Africa than by boycotting. So they bought the license back from the South African licensee and um, took over sub-Saharan uh, Adidas themselves and set up their own head office. And they bought in a Frenchman who was the CEO, they bought in a, a German guy who did the footwear and I got the job of handling the apparel side of things. And it was really interesting because their mandate was to take the brand um, and take the product into the previously disaffected groups of the community. And we started negotiations with the, the um, soccer bodies primarily because that was not a white sport at that time. Even the sports were divided. And um, we put our real thrust into the previously disadvantaged communities. And it, it was a really incredible negotiation period because at the same time, the white organizations, particularly the conservative ones who we had supported, were incredibly upset with us because we were now going to different communities. And I remember um, athletes, track, one guy, a track and field athlete, um, he was a 400 meter sprinter, actually world class 400 meter sprinter, walked into our office one day and threw his spikes at me because he was so disgusted that we were now supporting the black community. It was a brave thing for Adidas, or Adidas as they're known primarily in North America, and it's a story I think that's been forgotten by a lot of people. I mean, they were, yeah. they were really taking a chance. You know what, there are a lot of European organizations that were. There were a lot of organizations. Um, at that time, uh, the change that was happening in, in the business um, sector, in, not all of it, but in some of the business sectors of South Africa was, was quite interesting. You know, I, I always think that business can be a force for good. Um, and it was interesting that Anglo-America um, did a, 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 a scenario thing called High Road, Low Road Scenario, and a guy called Clem Sunter who was one of the very senior people in Anglo-America, traveled the country with this high, lo high road, low road scenario. And the message to the South African business and the population was, we've got two options. We either take the low road and the future doesn't look good, or we take the, take the high road and the future looks rosy. And um, businesses were very involved. The, the more liberal businesses were very involved in um, putting momentum behind the change in South Africa. Fascinating stuff. We're talking with David Lavister, CEO of Mountain Equipment Co-op, or MEC, or M-E-C. And uh, we'll pick up on the story right after this. We're coming to you this morning from the Beattie School of Business at Simon Fraser University's downtown campus. <laughs> talking with David Lavister of Mountain Equipment Co-op, and we'll get to the story of your company in a few minutes, but it was a fascinating story learning about you coming through as a young man, uh, the apartheid story, South Africa, the transition, and uh, the role that Adidas or Adidas, whom you were working with, uh, played a fairly substantial role in that time. We look back on it now as if it happened overnight. It took years for that, uh, for that transition to take place. Yeah, I, you know, and I, I was... In, in many ways, I, I was very fortunate to be in some interesting situations in the, the whole development. Um, at one point in at my university, I won't call it a career, my stage at university, one of my best friends was the stepson of a guy called Fonsel Slabert, who with Alex Borain formed an organization called Adasa that really brought the two sides together. And there's that famous story of the, um, the, the two leaders meeting on the bridge between South Africa and Zimbabwe in a train carriage. And they were part of the organization that brought that together. And um, I boarded with him I, in his house. 
and I had a room in his home. And on Sunday nights, these guys were, they were Afrikaners. They were, they were very traditional. They loved their barbecue. They called a braai, their barbecue, and they sing along on Sunday night. And they, we would sit at these barbecues and sing-alongs and listen to these discussions where um, they were questioning the future of the country and were really um, looking to drive change. So change happened in a lot of different places all at the same time. It was a very interesting time to be there and a fascinating thing to see. Do you get back there often? I've been back once in 15 years. Really? Uh, and we are going back this December again because it's some of the best kiteboarding in the world. <laughs> so there's, there's a reason to get back. You know. But you, at the same time, you must be looking forward to seeing how the country has changed. It um, has it. You know, it, it, it has. I, I can't really comment because, as I say, I, I, I've been back once. Um, what is interesting is that I didn't leave South Africa. I came to Canada. Um, and there's a bit of a difference in that, that I, I wasn't moving away from something. I was coming to something. So I, I, I have left South Africa behind in, in many ways. And as I say, I, I'm... I, It'll be good to go back and see the family again, just to check in. And I'm curious to see how the country's changed. But my life, my family is here in Canada, and I'm a Canadian citizen. So, so what did you come to? What attracted you to Canada? Uh, snowboarding and the snow. <laughs> I, I, was, I spent every holiday, uh, as much as I loved water sports, and I was in the water three or four times a, a week in, in South Africa, um, I was introduced to snowboarding. And I would spend every holiday and a lot of money coming to North America or Europe to snowboard. And uh, I was in Hood River one day uh, doing the, the, the um, snowboard in the morning and windsurf in the afternoon thing. And bumped into a whole bunch of Canadians and they said, you've got to go to Vancouver. And I said, Vancouver, it's snow all year round and there's Eskimos and igloos and you know, it's, I, it's going to be too cold for me. I'm kidding, sorry. And they, they, but they said, you've got to go to Vancouver. And I came to Vancouver, and I'd been here for three days. And I remember I was doing the tourist thing on Grass Mountain and snowboarding under lights just because it's a novelty. And coming off the mountain after having a couple of beers in the, in the, at, at the restaurant on the top after 10 o'clock, and I saw a young woman on her own in the bus shelter with a snowboard under her arm. And I thought, where in the world can you snowboard at night? But then where in the world would a young woman feel safe enough to catch public mm. transport off a mountain after 10 o'clock at night? And that was that I was sold. So a year and a half later, I, here we were. I remember being in Johannesburg uh, about 15 years ago, and the tour company wouldn't let us go into downtown Johannesburg because it just wasn't safe even to go into a mall. Or they didn't think it was. They weren't going to take the chance. We take our security so much for granted, uh, and you must think about that with your family here. Yes, um, it, but once again, as you say, you, you, you take things for granted. And I, In South Africa, I did have a very, I had an experience that, that made my wife at the time um, want to leave the country. Um, I was attacked in broad daylight by five guys who wanted to do me in, in the middle of the road. Um, but those things, you, you acclimatize very quickly, you become accustomed to things. And at the, by the same token, we, we, we become very accustomed to how safe this country is and how safe this community is. In fact, people get scared of going out in Vancouver and it's kind of like, well, why would you be? I mean, it's such a safe, such a safe environment. But I think we normalize everything and we acclimatize to everything and, and, and our situation becomes the norm, whether it's violent or whether it's safe. You have a, such an interesting story. We've hardly touched on, uh, on the company that you lead and uh, the uniqueness of it. So uh, fairly quickly, get, get us to uh, Mountain Equipment Co-op and how you got there. Uh, when I came to Vancouver, I didn't know how to mail a letter. I didn't have a job. I didn't have any leads. And I could not get an interview. And I had Marks and Spencers on my resume or an affiliate of Marks and Spencers. I had Adidas on my resume. I had... A, a world-class resume, and I could not get a door open. No one would even see me. And I'm white and I speak English. I can only imagine what someone from a, an Asian country must feel like if they can't speak English, because I couldn't get a door open. And eventually, 
someone took a chance on me, and that someone was Brian Hill from Aritzia, who was on this show beforehand. And um, I think that at the time I was the right person for Brian, and he was the right person for me, but I credit Brian with getting me on my feet. And while I was, I was doing, working with, for Brian as a consultant, but at the same time I targeted four organizations that I really wanted to work for because I liked what they stood for, I liked the whole active and the outdoor thing, and I would scratch on their doors on a regular basis. And eventually one of the doors opened, and it was MEC. Um, I started there um, heading up their product, and they had recently changed some senior management positions, and, and I was in charge of merchandise. And from there, one thing led to another, and here we are today. And when was that? Uh, that was nine years ago when I joined them, and I've been in this role now for almost five. As CEO? As CEO, yeah. And we'll be back and talk much more about the role of CEO and uh, the unique quality of the company that is known to many as MEC, Mountain Equipment Co-op. You're with Bill Good. We're broadcasting this morning from the Beattie School of Business, the downtown campus of Simon Fraser University. Back with David Labitz, who Chief Executive Officer of Mountain Equipment Co-op, otherwise known as MEC and MEC. What do you call it? MEC. MEC, but to be honest, what actually happens is normally anything west of the Rockies is MEC and anything east of the Rockies is MEC. Interesting but, but in terms call... of branding. Yeah, and uh, I think that the fact that some people call it MEC and some people call, call it MEC is great because it, it's, it's something that's personal and familiar to them. So. And what makes it different from most other retail companies or operations? Um, it's a cooperative, and there are lots of pros. What, is, what does that mean? Well, lots of pros and cons to being a co-op, and I'm not going to go into things. But the one thing that the co-op allows you to do is focus, because your customers are your shareholders, um, and it's it, it, you. You don't have any sort of tension about who you're trying to look after, and really, we are focused because of, of what we are. We are laser focused on providing our customer and the consumer with product um, to get them active in the outdoors. We're also a very purpose-driven organization, and I, I mean it. I absolutely mean it, and our purpose is to inspire and enable everyone to lead active outdoor lifestyles. And even as the market changes, as demographics change, as cultures change, and people become more urbanized, um, that purpose remains our North Star. And while our tactics change, we're very stubborn on that purpose. So. It makes running an organization with that kind of purity um, quite rewarding. And how is your customer different? How much more engaged is your company or your customer with the company than somebody who just goes into what is a, another athletic shop or outdoor shop? I, I wouldn't assume to say that all of our customers are more engaged. I think that most people, to be fair, are going to go to any organization that offers them the best service, the best product, and the best price. So we can never assume uh, the fact that we have um, the secret source that we can just throw out there, let's angel dust and people will come to us. Um, we have to be a professional retailer. We have to provide the best service, the best product, uh, and the best value all the time. But we do have a small section of our membership because of we're a cooperative who are very engaged in the co-op and uh, are very outspoken uh, um, and, as I say, very engaged in, and in the process of the governance of the organization. And how would you say that you have changed the company or how has the company evolved in nine years under your leadership? Um, first of all, I have to credit um, the senior management team because I'm one of a team of people that have driven the change and also we've been working with our board um, to, to change what the organization does and really it was driven by when we looked at the future of our, of our customer, we call the member, uh, and we looked at the changes happening in Canada, as I said, the change in demographics, the fact that more people live in urban environments, the fact that youth um, play in different ways the fact that the culture of the country is changing so dramatically. In fact, more than 40% of all the major metropolitan areas are now visible minorities. And 
our organization was based on a very Anglo-Saxon masculine approach to activity. And when we sort of extrapolated what our membership looked like in 10 years' time, we knew we were not going to be relevant. We knew that most of our customers came through the university system because they had the time and money to play. And when we look at the university system, it's becoming more female and more culturally diverse. So our feedstock was changing and the writing was on the wall. So we really went into changing the organization completely and we changed the, the purpose from originally it was to help people realize the benefits of self-propelled wilderness recreation. And that is a real old white guy statement if ever there was one to the new statement we have today. And today we recognize that people recreate in different ways, um, that there are different motivations to getting out there and doing things. And um, we've, we've really changed the organization significantly to be more appealing and more relevant and, and more vibrant. How? Changing the purpose was one, um, and then aligning with that is we've changed our assortments, we've made our products more fashionable because we know that women in different cultures want a product that looks good, even though it is still premised on quality and functionality. We've brought in cycling and running because we know that running and cycling and hiking or walking are the gateway activities to the outdoors. Um, we've acknowledged that even though people recreate in the outdoors, they still keep fit during the week in an indoor and urban environment, and all that's good. So really what we've done is we've taken off the blinkers, and we've said that if you're getting out, even if you're getting out the front door, that's good. It's good for the country, it's good for society, it's good for the health system. And we've become far more inclusive. We'll be back and talk a little bit about uh, your uh, employees, uh, what you look for in terms of... Uh, your leadership group and uh, uh, just your day-to-day -day employee. David Lobster is uh, our guest and we'll be right back with more from the Beattie School of Business at Simon Fraser University. <laughs> David Lobster is uh, our guest. We're at the uh, Beattie School of Business in downtown Vancouver. This morning you talked about uh, when you came to this country scratching at the door and a ritzy as Brian Hill opened the door. Who do you open the door to? What do you look for when it comes to people coming to work for you? Um, I, I know a lot of leaders say this, but I really do. I look for people that are smarter than me. I, I, I really do. And I've got no ego behind uh, being around people that are, uh, are brighter than me at, at what they do. Um, so first of all, I look for people that know what they're doing. Um, I look for people that are curious and energetic and um, really want to learn and grow and contribute. I also look for people that can communicate. Um, I, I'm, I'm nervous about too much ego because these days um, things are so, business is so complex that even though people are specialists in their area, collaboration is vital. And if people cannot collaborate, it's going to impact the organization um, and the team significantly. So collaboration becomes a very important part of it. How many employees do you have? We've got about one, over 1,500 across the country. Just over 200 in head office. 200 in head office? Yeah, just over more 235. And so when you're interviewing those people, expand a little bit on what it is you're looking for. You, you, you touched on it, but are there certain qualities that you really want in someone, especially somebody who's coming into head office? Um, I only interview senior management staff, so I don't interview anyone. Um, anyone that my team uh, brings in, they do the interviews. Sometimes they'll run them past me just to get a, a gut check, but um, I, I don't necessarily ever say if you, if, you, if you want to empower people and you want them to be smarter than you, you have to let them do their jobs. So I try and keep my hands off their jobs as much as possible set directions, set goals, uh, set deliverables, and hold them accountable, but don't try and do their job for them because it doesn't work if you want strong people. Um, when I'm interviewing strong people and I see that some corn fairy is, is in the room and we work, we work with, with them um, on, on getting our senior management, you know, it, it's a feeling. You have to speak to people and I believe that attitude uh, is the most important thing and fit is the most important thing. Um, people can learn a lot of the technical stuff on the job, but 
you need someone who has the, the desire and the attitude to get the job done. And, and I, I don't know that I can necessarily put a finger on it because I've made some awful mistakes hiring and I've made some very good hires. And the good hires are the ones that in your gut you feel they're right. And the awful hires I've made, I've looked at their resume and I've been completely blown away by their resume and my, I didn't listen to my gut. So it's a difficult thing and I'm afraid I don't have a very lucid answer for that one. Tell me a little bit about your ability to strike a balance between work and life. You're clearly fit and fitness is a, is a big part of your life. What's your, when does your day start? I'm a bit of a hedonist, I got to tell you. And I, I think I'm a disciplined hedonist, but I am a hedonist. <laughs> so I, my day starts at seven. I'm not one of those people that doesn't sleep. I, enjoy eight hours sleep a night. Um, I exercise at lunchtime, so I don't eat lunch, I, and, so, and, and I, I don't eat a lot during the day, um, so I can go for a day without eating, which means I can work out at lunchtime. Um, but yeah, my day starts at seven, and a cup of coffee, you've got to have that. And generally, we wrap up pretty early in the evening, unless there's a party going on. But, <laughs> But what you say wrap up, you're talking about your, your daily life. When oh, do, sorry. When do you leave I, the it, office? Okay, so I, it, I'm in the office by 8.15, and I leave the office generally between... I'm, I never lay, leave the office later than 6. Um, the other thing I believe in is if your staff see you... If you're saying to your staff, get a work-life balance, and they see you working really late, then they feel compelled to do the same. So you have to lead by example. I also believe that people fit their work into the time they have available. And I've worked for organizations where people have worked really late, and I can tell you that that water cooler is busy throughout the day. Um, whereas organizations that where you try and get people to deliver what they can efficiently and effectively, um, you can do what you have to do and still get out of there by six o'clock in the evening. If there are times when things are very busy and you have to extend your day, but generally I believe that if you're not doing your job with a normal working day, you either not being efficient or the job's too big for you. Do you take weekends? I take weekends. I'm very good at that. And what do you do? Depends on the weather. Um, anything. Depends whether it's snowing, whether it's sunny, whether it's with the winds blowing. Um, I've got, a, I've got a, a great palette of activities that I can do. And uh, not just personally, but with friends and family. I mean, this last weekend, it was... Saturday morning, looked at the weather report for Sunday, and it was going to be summer all over again. So I threw my eight-year-old in the truck, and we went up to the lake and spent a day on the lake mountain biking and, and wakeboarding. So you know, nice. British Columbia, whatever you want to do, you can do. It's all there. Talking with David Labister, and when we come back, what I call my Vanity Fair questions, and uh, he is prepared, and uh, I think you'll enjoy our final segment. Talking with uh, David Labister, CEO of Mountain Equipment Co-op, uh, MEC, M-E-C, uh, what I call my Vanity Fair questions. If you could have dinner with any four people, living or dead, who would they be and why? Uh, it was a great question. Actually, it was a great thing to think about. And really, I looked at what do I enjoy? And not rather who would I want, but what do I enjoy? And I, I love cooking. Um, and I love being at a dinner table where there are a lot of intelligent, funny people who are there to eat my food and entertain me. So I would cook a meal and I would want some funny, intelligent people at the table who would entertain me. So it would be the likes of Tina Fey, Jon Stewart, my wife who can certainly hold um, her end up with the best of them. And then the fourth one, I was a bit stuck on it. You know, is it Bill Cosby? Is it, you know, I, I wasn't, but so there's the fourth is still open right now. <laughs> Billy Connolly, someone who's funny and bright. So I think the fourth one would be selected on, on whether they like my cooking or not. <laughs> it's funny. I, I did think that you might throw in a Nelson Mandela. You know, and that's where I went in the beginning. I went to, and funny, more than Nelson Mandela, Bishop Tutu. I have ah. incredible respect for that man. Um, and as gracious as Nelson Mandela is, Bishop Tutu has incredible courage. And that's where I went first. But I think that's the standard answer that, that, that one would expect. And I thought, 
what would I really enjoy? What was what would an evening that I, I just would just be a, once again I go back to that hedonist thing, mm -hmm. and funny, intelligent people who like my cooking. Hard to beat. Absolutely, it'd be a great evening. Do you like to travel? Yes, I. Well, yes and no. Um, travel these days has become a bit of a chore. Um, I'm on the road too much, but I certainly do love different cultures, different places. Um, experiencing the new. My life has, has been a constant experiencing the new and change, and I really enjoy that. But the actual travel itself is... Flying is not much fun. It's, it's not a lot of Airports fun anymore. Airports are hell. Yeah. Uh, but uh, some place has to entice you to, to make you willing to put up with that aggravation. So where have you been that you'd really like to go back to, and where have you not been that you'd like to go to? The, the one country that surprisingly I haven't been to that I want to go to is Australia. And uh, that's kind of one of my bucket list. The places I've been to, I'd love to go back to, oh my God, there's just so many of them, from Osaka to Tuscany, um, and everything in between, because there's just, there's so many rich cultures and places in the world that are fantastic experiences. And uh, a lot of them have great places to recreate and great food. It's interesting you say Australia, and. Uh I hope nobody takes offense at this, but I'm a little bit surprised because I think of Australia and South Africa as being in many ways very similar. Yes, they are. And uh, we were funny, we were, going to, we were going to go to Australia instead of South Africa this December, but my mom's kind of nearing the end right now, so we thought we'd, we'd go and sort of visit her one last time. Um, but both of them have incredible coastlines and lots of ocean and lots of surf. And I think that would and be... And lots of sunshine. And lots of sunshine, yeah. It always surprises me when people come, not so much from South Africa, because I think for obvious reasons, there's a... Although you said you came to Canada, you didn't leave South Africa. A lot of people have left South Africa. Uh, I'm always surprised when people leave Australia <laughs> to come to Canada, because to many of us in British Columbia, especially who, who live with the rain rather than love it, look at Australia and kind of go, I mean, I was in Sydney and I thought, oh, this is just a nice big Vancouver with sunshine all the time. You know, it, it, it's, it, it's not the rain, it's the dark days that sometimes yes. get me down. But, you know, if you look at our mountain biking, if you look at our skiing, our snowboarding, our paddling, our whitewater paddling, our, our touring paddling, um, our oceans, um, all the activities we have here, if you love the outdoors, there are very few places. I mean, Cape Town and, and Sydney are fantastic places to be. But I would say there's more diversity here within a, a, a two-hour drive of the city. Backcountry skiing is just phenomenal in British Columbia. You clearly came here and have made the most of being here, not just in terms of business and family, and I see your wife nodding her head, but you have really thrived on working and living, and I think the emphasis on living in British Columbia. You know, you, you have one kick at life, and uh, I think that you have to make the best of who you are because that's all you have. And uh, I'm going to go back to that head in this thing again. You know, I, I just, I love life and every minute of it. Well, and I've enjoyed every minute of talking to you, and thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for having me. You bet. Yeah.